Okay, so let's uh, let's get this session started. This is the uh, Dhaka Data Art for Climate Action Conference keynote with um, Dr. Andrea Polly, and it's a great pleasure for us to to have Dr. Polly here um, uh, tonight in Hong Kong and um, uh, daytime in Europe and at a very extreme hour of 5 a.m. where Andrea is herself at this very moment in New Mexico, I believe. So Andrea Poli is a professor at the University of New Mexico. She has uh, a double appointment in the at the College of Fine Arts and also at the School of Engineering. She's an endowed chair of digital media. And as an educator, she has developed and built uh, programs from scratch and she has uh, uh, done this in Chicago and in New York and of course at the University of New Mexico. She has uh, many awards from um, amongst others the UNESCO Digital Award and the Fulbright Specialist Award. Her, she has done service to uh, professional organizations and I would just highlight her work with the uh, World Forum for Acoustic Ecology, uh, uh, the, uh, the Global Organization and also the New York Society Chapter for Acoustic Ecology. As, um, as an uh, artist, she has a career of, uh, um, well, at least 20 years that I've been aware of her work. Uh, and uh, she very much started with, with uh, uh, doing sonifications of uh, uh, clim climatological data, working closely with scientists. And I think this is one of the real, um, let's say, real particularities with the way that uh, that uh, Andrea Pole has been engaging with climate science and with climate action and connecting it with her artwork. And then she's moved into audiovisual um, public artworks and uh, has garnered a portfolio of at least 25 such large scale works in locations in the US uh, and in, in Europe from Pittsburgh to Zagreb. Uh, and as well as uh, exhibitions, art exhibitions from Paris and also here in Hong Kong. Her book from uh, 2012 that she, uh, that she edited has made uh, a very significant, uh, uh, been of significant importance to uh, people working with uh, uh, art that is based on climate, um, climate science awareness and action. And it's called Far Field, Digital uh, Culture, Climate Change and the Poles. And uh, the poles here are, of course, the Arctic and the Antar Antarctic regions where she traveled on um, several locations to work together with the artists at these locations. Sorry, to work together with the, with the scientists and to, uh, um, to gather audio recordings and, and video footage, but also, uh, co also conducting interviews with the scientists and putting this into a very multifaceted uh, work uh, of, of her artistic output. So, um, so with this brief introduction of uh, Andrea Poli, I will just uh, say that we are very happy here at Dhaka to have her as uh, our keynote speaker for this evening. And I will leave the word to Dr. Poli. Well, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, I've really been enjoying reading uh, everyone's paper it, and uh, just it's such an honor to speak to this uh, accomplished group of uh, people working in data art for uh, climate action and I, you know, and I've been thinking about well, well how can I contribute to this and I think. Um, you know, through the framework of hack the grid thinking about how to engage uh, audiences uh, across many different disciplines. Um, as we have we have heard uh, the scientists themselves um, and also the general public so i'm going to try to frame things and I, I think you can think about this uh, hack the grid book uh, that came out a few years ago. Um, with the Carnegie Museum of art is a is a kind of a framing of these different types of works that my I, I am doing and that others are um, doing. 
And, you know, I think we hear the these words hack the grid and there's a lot of publicity out there about um, the cyber warfare. And that's not uh, what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about an older um, kind of the more traditional uh, definition of hacking uh, to make your own, uh, which is really creating and sharing hostility to secrecy, the right to fork uh, your programming and share your programming, uh, distaste of authority, free, freedom of inquiry, uh, sharing as an ideology and strategy, emphasis on rationality and playful cleverness. So all these uh, kind of more traditional ideas about hacking. Now I um, entered, I guess my my entry into climate change, exploring climate change in my work really came from a fascination with uh, math and algorithms uh, back in the 90s. So um, when chaos theory came out, and of course, this is the, um, the Lorenz attractor or the butterfly attractor, uh, I became very interested in these very simple mathematical equations that I could program into my computer to get uh, very naturalistic kinds of images. And I started to work on algorithmic composition at that time, thinking about music as a kind of a natural form. Uh, and so I would create these somewhat musical compositions and they weren't, um, they weren't really music in my mind. They were somewhat more regular than what I would consider music or I would have considered music at the time, uh, but they were musical. And um, I did that work in the 90s and I really stopped um, working in that area and, and started working in you know more uh, community-based art. Um, and about 10 years later, I was involved in an art science um, conference, probably similar to what you all are, are at. And I met um, a meteorologist and I told uh, him, his name was Glenn Van Nau, and I told him about the work that I had done 10 years earlier. And he said, well, you know, did you know that the Lorenz attractor is a model for air moving through the atmosphere in a vacuum? And I said, well, yes, but tell me more. And um, he said, in those 10 years, um, meteorological models had advanced so much and computer technology had advanced so much that it was possible to recreate uh, all the parameters of a historic storm like a hurricane um, or a winter snowstorm uh, in data. And so we started to collaborate and we did this project called Atmospherics Weatherworks, which is in the permanent collection of the Whitney Museum of Art. And it takes um, a storm, uh, in this case, Hur Hurricane Bob from 1991 that hit the east coast of the United States and models uh, 16 channels. You can see 16 channels here uh, along the east coast, 16 geographic points uh, at five different uh, elevations from sea level to the top of the atmosphere. And so again, I wasn't really considering climate change at this time, it was just about interest and beauty in um, meteorology, really. Um, and I'm going to play, I should be playing, um, let me try this again. Oh, here it is. So this is the sonification of the data at the top of the atmosphere, 60,000 feet. And this is a hurricane. And you can imagine that you could fly an airplane over a hurricane. So really at high, higher levels of the atmospheres, hurricanes are very calm. The wind speeds are very calm. So I'm mapping wind speeds to loudness. I'm mapping temperatures to pitch. And so you can hear something that's very ethereal and, and quiet and um, Cold. Uh, this is the storm at sea level, and I was mapping 24 hours of the um, largest storm activity. Uh, that was one real question: where to where to begin, where to end. Uh, and so you can hear that the tones are lower, and it's a bit more chaotic uh, in the movement, which is really what happens at sea level. Um, you know, as, as you know, uh, there um, during a, a hurricane. 
So my model for those sonifications and really for the algorithmic music that I was doing um, was this, the soundscape. And um, in the introduction, they talked about uh, my work with uh, acoustic ecology. And I noticed that you all are doing sound walks, which is really wonderful. And uh, so as I was creating these sonifications and computer programming, uh, I was going on sound walks and uh, got together with a number of people in New York that were interested in acoustic ecology and sound walking. We started the New York Society and we created this uh, map. It was one of the first Google Maps hacks. So maybe one of the first hacks um, uh, in this hack the grid idea uh, was a map that people could contribute their uh, sound walk recordings of the five bur boroughs of New York into this um, this map called Sound Seeker. So really making these sonifications, I was listening a lot to the soundscape. And of course, the soundscape, um, as you know, is often very ambient. Um, and so I started thinking about the data that I was using, and I was using this very dramatic data for weather. And I thought, well, why don't I use climate data? Perhaps climate data would be more like ambient music. I love electronic ambient music. So in the early 2000s, around 2001, 2002, I approached the climate research group um, at NASA Goddard Institute to see about sonifying climate. And at that time, I really had no thought to climate change. And it was my first meeting with Dr. Cynthia Rosenzweig that really, I mean, shocked me and made me kind of sit down in that she said, this top scientist at NASA said to me that climate change was the biggest challenge that humanity had ever, will ever face. And I, I had no realization of that whatsoever. So with that meeting, I really started to study and become interested in this, what I really thought at the time was a kind of boring or esoteric um, computer science problem of working with meteorology suddenly became this very urgent and also politicized um, issue. So did a project with uh, uh, Dr. Rosenzweig, Heat in the Heartbeat of the City, uh, worked with a, a snow and ice um, scientist who was modeling data from the North Pole in real time and used uh, live um, images from the North Pole webcam that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration deploys uh, every summer and kind of linking those things. And this, in fact, was the first project that I presented. This is along the, um, the Hudson River, but I also presented it in a number of different places, including in the UK. And when I presented this work in the UK, I thought that I was very neutrally presenting a sonification of data and images. Um, you know, I, I try often to create these computer programs to sonify or visualize data in a way that um, just is very direct, or at least I thought at the time that it was very direct. But um, I had someone come up to me and say they didn't realize I was the artist and they came up to me and said this artist is very political and they're a propagandist and they're trying to tell people that climate change is real and I was really surprised um, by that reaction to something that I felt was really neutral. Um, at the same time um, that I was doing this work, of course, 9-11 uh, happened in New York City. I was living in New York City. Uh, I went um, sort of escaped Manhattan uh, over this bridge. This is the Queensboro Bridge, the 59th Street Bridge. And um, after 9-11, um, the East River Bridges, there's three major East River Bridges. They all have beautiful necklace lights uh, that light them in the evening. Uh, those lights were turned off uh, to, for the city to save money. Um, it was kind of a, you know, thinking back of a small version of what happened globally um, with COVID. Um, so I, I thought about these lights being turned off and, and the, trying to save the money from energy and how 
uh, when there's an economic crisis, the aesthetics are kind of the first things, the aesthetics of a city are the first things that uh, have to go away. And what if instead um, we use renewable power, like wind power, uh, to power those lights? And so I, I got involved with a group called New York 2050 and that was imagining the future of New York City. And I created this proposal to put wind turbines on the Queensboro Bridge. And um, I went as far at this time, this was about 20 years ago now, and I went as far as speaking to the um, the energy company uh, in New York uh, City, GE, and making a proposal. And I had talked to some engineers and they said to, in order to do this, to power not only the necklace lights, but also um, uh, parts of uh, Roosevelt, Roosevelt Island, which is, is um, kind of directly underneath this bridge, um, there would be a five-year payback. So payback meaning uh, the energy that would be produced, uh, the, the cost of doing this project, which was at the time about $3 million, of doing this project would be entirely paid back within the course of five years. And I said this to the electrical company and they said, well, that's not good enough. We we need to have a two year payback for energy projects. And I, I tried to make the argument that, um, you know, this isn't just an energy project. It's a project about um, public awareness and aesthetics. Um, but at that time, again, about 20 years ago, there was not um, not the interest or the motivation to do something like this. So I, I set this project aside, but I also realized that I needed to learn a lot of things. And one of the things that I wanted to learn was how a feasibility study might work. And I, I wanted to learn that from the artist perspective. So a feasibility study for a project like this would be to put a weather station on top of this bridge and see uh, the wind power potential. And so I had never operated a weather station before. And so I got five of these sort of semi-professional weather stations that um, put data their data <clears throat> out on the internet. And I started putting them at community centers around just to see what would happen and putting the data online. This is a project called Hello Weather. And I think really, um, this project, I'm, I'm excited to kind of show you guys this because, um, and maybe it's sort of going under the hood. This project was not, in in my view, sort of as successful as I would have liked it to be. Here's some of the places where the weather stations were placed, um, New Delhi, India, places in Europe, and um, places around the U.S. Um, I had the idea, and these are this is the weather station network within the U.S. Um, there's a number of different weather, uh, weather stations where amateurs will put up their own weather stations and share their data. Um, I thought that people would really welcome this data at community centers, would welcome this data and use it to do their own projects. Um, but I found that as an artist coming in with the weather station, um, I think people felt that, you know, this was my data project and they didn't feel comfortable with the idea of using data from my project or they felt that they wanted to do their use their own data and that to use data from my project would be, you know, kind of be becoming part of this project. So uh, the places where I found the data to be most useful to people or that people were doing projects with the data uh, were places like um, a, a city park or um, a, you know community centers where the focus was not on art or on uh, technology, but where the focus was on uh, community and engaging with the outside. Uh, one of the projects I did um, create from this data was called um, Atmosfeed. And I, it allowed people to, this was um, using Twitter uh, back when the Twitter um, API allowed you to send automatic tweets. Um, this was a time when the um, Power Bridge in London was tweeting. And um, so you could, um, so the, in this project, someone could uh, subscribe to a weather station across the entire 
uh, weather underground net network, not just uh, my five stations, and get a tweet uh, once a day uh, that was a famous quote under 100, 120 characters that uh, corresponded to the weather of the day. So I had about 2000 of these different quotes set up in a, a kind of an Excel spreadsheet that um, matched different kinds of weather. But let me go further. So um, in that project uh, that showed the North Pole, uh, uh, the round um, projection, uh, I had wanted to look at what was happening at the poles with regard to climate change. And I found an opportunity to go actually south rather than north to go to Antarctica. So in 2007 and 2008, I went with the National Science Foundation to Antarctica. This is the South Pole Station, the old um, station. This is one of the um, sites that I lived at in the dry valleys um, in Antarctica. I went to McMurdo. I stayed in McMurdo Station, which is sort of directly south from New Zealand, from Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, and here are some of the scientists that I uh, worked alongside of. Um, a, uh, a geologist, a biologist, um, and an engineer, uh, Hassan Basajic there in the center. And Hassan's uh, job was to gather data from weather stations throughout the dry valleys. Uh, some of those stations had been there at the time I was there, had been there longer than Hassan had been alive, uh, 30, uh, 35 years or so. And um, so I was able to go to these sites and then use some of the data to create sonifications. And I'm just gonna play some of that. We're at the Taylor Glacier Met Station. The main, the main thing that we're trying to do is, is monitoring long-term climate um, as opposed to seeing what the weather will be like the next couple days. So that again is a very kind of ambient kind of sound using the climate data that the long-term ecological research um, project is um, collecting. But you also heard uh, the sounds of the, the voice of the, of the scientists. And for this album, uh, Sonic Antarctica, a full length album with I included sonifications of the data, soundscape recordings throughout Antarctica, including man-made sounds like uh, some of the um, giant uh, fixed wing aircraft and, um, and helicopters and the voices of the scientists, <clears throat> excuse me. And this was, upon request to, to include the voices of the scientists was really upon request from uh, the label for this, um, this CD, Grün Recorder, uh, which is a German label. And they really felt that the voices of the scientists provided context for the sonifications. And I was really happy that they did um, ask for this. Um, because many of the scientists, I did, I think, over 35 interviews with scientists, recorded interviews with scientists while I was in Antarctica and, and uh, across the um, globe uh, interviewing climate scientists. Um, a lot of the scientists were saying there's a war on climate. And at the time in the US, you couldn't say the words climate change. If you were a scientist, you couldn't publish, you know, climate change. Um, and the scientists really felt that to talk to me as you know an artist and to publish their words in a context that isn't a scientific context allowed them the freedom to talk about some of the things that they were seeing and some of the things that they were concerned about so i think i wanted to i want to really make that point that um that is what I see as one of the real needs for the kind of work that we're doing is that we can bring to the public the words of the scientists and the, the concerns of the scientists that they actually can't do in their own um, research uh, because of the limitations uh, of their field. Um, 
So this is one of the scientists that I um, interviewed, Andreas Fischlin. He was part of the Nobel Prize winning group um, uh, when the IPCC uh, won that. And um, in addition to the CD, I created a, um, a video called Ground Truth, uh, talking about uh, this relationship between gathering data in person with our bodies versus gathering data from machines or like weather stations. Uh, and then some of this research came out, um, it, was, it was part of my PhD uh, research and also in this book that I co-edited uh, with Jane Marshing, where we uh, put together uh, works by artists in the more contemporary phase of Antarctic and Arctic research who have been using digital technology and digital media. So there's some wonderful um, contributions uh, in this book. Um, so having done so many projects using the digital representation of weather and climate and sort of looking at and experiencing climate, but not really working with the materials. So as an artist, I wanted to explore the materials. And this was one of the first projects that I did in that called Cloud Car. It's a car fitted with a mist system. It was inspired by Diller and Scafidio's Blur Building. Um, and uh, here's the portable version that has tanks of NOx and compressed uh, water. Uh, and it's uh, basically a car uh, covered in a cloud. And when I present this, um, I have uh, people outside the car with fact sheets saying, if you have to drive, uh, here's some things you can do to reduce your uh, emissions. And uh, I love to tell this story. One of the first times that I showed uh, cloud cart was just on the street in a parking place in New York City. And we attracted New York's bravest, of course, the fire department. And they thought that it was on fire, that the car was on fire. And uh, when uh, I explained to them that, um, no, it's a, it's, it's missed. Um, we got into a great conversation about water propulsion, which is, of course, their, uh, the fire department specialty. And they put, I, I always like to show this as my proudest moment as an artist, they put the cloud car sticker on the fire truck because um, I like the project so much. And um, I also found that using MIST could become a platform for digital projection. So telling stories, uh, very simple kinds of shapes could be, um, uh, resolved on the mist. And so here is uh, outside of Death Valley, um, a projection on the mist. Uh, I also worked uh, with uh, how air uh, might change shape. So this is a project called Breather. This is at Parco Arte Vivente um, in Turin, uh, which is, of course, the home of the Fiat factory. So for this exhibition, I uh, was able to use two wonderful vintage Fiats, uh, one for uh, cloud car and one for this project breather and in breather um, was kind of inspired by being um, in a place with a lot of air pollution and feeling like I had a bag over my head and so this bouncy expands and contracts over the course of a minute over um, this car uh, as if it's breathing. Um, so uh, in the introduction it was mentioned uh, some of my teaching so I uh, started in 2009 a uh, research group called the Social Media Work Group at the University of New Mexico. I moved from New York uh, in order to do that. Um, that project has now expanded into a project called STEAM New Mexico, where we work in science, technology, engineering, um, and math across um, the state of New Mexico. and. Um, uh, this is one of the uh, kind of mottos or themes that we use in our um, uh, in our in our research group. Um, there's more information available at our fingertips during a walk in the woods than in any uh, computer system. And let me just ask: Is my screen looking very uh, yellow for the time? I can change that. This is my. Um, 
sorry that's my my sleep color um okay fine. let me there we go we're back to to normal sorry about that um so this is a quote from Mark Weiser, um, who is a pioneer of ubiquitous computing in the 90s, and you probably are familiar with his work. Um, and I, you know, I was interested in sort of asking, what are the social and cultural effects of defining the natural and man-made environment as information space? How can and should a hybrid social media practice emerge from and engage with the arid desert environment of the American Southwest and beyond? And what kinds of mobile locative media and ubiquitous computing platforms can help users engage with this environment and how can this practice connect and extend to communities globally so I sort of when I started the lab I kind of had these basic research questions in mind, but then. Um, also. Um, this was another motto that came from one of the students uh, that I was working with. Um, in an interview, you know, he said technologically we had no idea what we were doing, and I love this because I think it really fits the the hacking idea, and I think it really fits what you know. If you ask yourself, what do students want to do, or what does anyone really want to do? Um, and to me, I think the answer is what I've I've never done before. Uh, people want to do what they've never done before, and to be in an arts context in, in a media um, creative technology context i think that is some of the power of what what we do um let me move forward here so this is uh these are some of my researchers this is a navajo nation where we worked with navajo artist Vinaya yazi on a project that took people um a mobile media project that took people uh past two of the largest coal-fired power plants in the country um, on Navajo Nation that are based on, on Navajo Nation, but don't give power to the people there and uh, the stories of activists and, and medicine men and how they've been um, dealing with that. Um, in addition to, or I, I think a part of my teaching is to um, do uh, organized conferences um you know, similar to what you're experiencing with your um your teacher and um at your your university and one of the ones that i did uh when i first came to new mexico was um the icea uh, symposium icea 2012 machine wilderness and a machine wilderness was really looking at car culture so i had i had worked with the cars uh that you saw in those previous works and then I wanted to explore what other people were doing and uh, hosted uh, projects with artists who were uh, creating cars that can go on um, roads, highways, and uh, defunct rail uh, ways to find villages that were cut off uh, throughout Mexico uh, from um, the rest of uh, the country uh, when the trains uh, were discontinued. Um, uh, a colleague of mine, Jen Hartman and Chrissy Orr, created a uh, mobile uh, podcast called seedbroadcast.org, uh, talking about seed saving. Um, uh, we hosted Christopher Marionetti's uh, incredible symphony, uh, 505, uh, which in this case is a low rider symphony. Uh, in New Mexico, uh, there's a home of uh, the low rider cars that are really hydraulic robots that dance in different ways. And this artist created a symphony for uh, these are uh, these cars to dance. It was really an incredible um, experience. Uh, here you can see some of that um, that really brought together members of the community. Um, <clears throat> This artist um, based in Brazil in Sao Paulo, who was <clears throat> creating vehicles out of um, junk uh, just found on the street, beautiful, beautiful vehicles. And um, during um, ICEA 2012, I had um, the pleasure of uh, experiencing the work of Paul Van Aus and how he worked with people in the community. Uh, Paul Van Aus, of course, is uh, doing bio art. Uh, where he's experimenting with uh, things like this, showing DNA, um, illustrating that when you are uh, viewing DNA, um, the way, the process in which you 
um, create those visualizations of the data is very fluid and can be manipulated in many different ways. So he um, works with those ideas. And that's when I started to become interested in um, biohacking. But let me, before I get into that, um, I'll talk about uh, some of the, some of my work uh, with air quality. So uh, after working with weather stations for a long time, uh, I discovered through an interview with a scientist that there were monitors for particulate pollution. And so I got one of these uh, monitors. It was a nephilometer. It was donated uh, from a company called Met One and created this project called Particle Falls. This is in Paris during COP21. And Particle Falls, uh, well, I'll just show. Um, uh, Particle Falls visualizes in real time um, particulate pollution. So when there's particulate pollution levels are low uh, locally, um, you see a beautiful blue waterfall. And when they're high, um, more particles appear on the waterfall and very high, the waterfall turns into a fireball. And so this has been really interesting and amazing to present in a number of different um, places around the world because um, it has been very surprising to me at how um, levels change. For example, if a diesel vehicle pulls up next to the nephilometer, it, you know, it'll go crazy. Um, so there's um, the invisible uh, pollution that is really so active. Um, and um, so the nephilometer that I used originally for that Particle Falls project um, cost about $15,000. I had to have it uh, donated to the project. Um, but 10 years later, um, devices like this became available. And you're probably familiar with this Airbeam or Purple Air. Um, and there's a number of different products out there that you can um, get for a couple hundred dollars, or you could make yourself with a 3D printer and basic electronics for about $30. Um, so the technology has become much more accessible to hackers and uh, people who are familiar, who are learning um, how to use microprocessors, and microcontrollers. Things are becoming so much more accessible. And that's, um, where um, I think there's an opportunity for people to, uh, for artists like us, to really engage the public with learning this type of technology and doing amazing things. So this is a, the project in Zagreb. Um, use three of those air beam um, particulate sensors on an existing um, LED panel to again visualize um, real time pollution. Um, and I just want to, and then this is a project um, visualizing weather. So I had been doing a lot of those projection works with um, the Particle Falls. Um, and in the time, again, in that 10 years, LEDs which are so much more visible uh, in light, um, in ambient light situations, the prices of those has gone down incredibly. So this was one of the first pieces that I did. It's um, called Skylight at the Albuquerque uh, Balloon Museum. And it's about 20 feet and has eight um, LEDs. But um, after I did that project, I found that using the microprocessors and microcontrollers um, allow and LEDs allowed for scaling up to uh, a much larger project. So in, I think it must have been 2015 or so, uh, about 15 years after I originally did that uh, Queensboro Bridge conceptual project, um, that didn't actually happen, and I put it on aside. I saw a um, a call for proposals to light um, one of these three sisters bridges. These are the bridge uh, bridges um, in Pittsburgh 
called the Three Sisters. And one of the bridges was being renamed for Rachel Carson, of course, the famous environmentalist. So I made a proposal to light that bridge using wind power. I found a local wind power company. They created 16 custom turbines in what they called a nano grid and placed those on the bridge. I used about 52 of these uh, microcontrollers, Raspberry Pis, um, in a network system to um, light not only the, uh, the turbines, but the entire bridge itself. And um, so to scale from, you know, that sort of 20 foot eight strips to something like this was really, um, you know, more of a transportation problem than a technology problem because the technology was so scalable. So I just want to speak to um, microprocessors and kind of hacker and makerspace materials as being so um, accessible, you know, uh, a middle school, a high school student uh, can learn and use these um, devices and then they can scale up to something like this. Um, so this project in 2016 to 2018 uh, really raised awareness of wind power potential in Pittsburgh. The, um, the uh, wind turbine manufacturer local had already done a feasibility study of wind power on the bridges. Uh, so that was really wonderful. And um, we were able to not only, so the original proposal that I had for the Queensboro Bridge was to just light the, the necklace lights, but in this case, in the 15 years the technology had advanced so we could animate for example uh what wind power potential could be we, we told some stories some simple stories with um movement of these lights so this is uh you can see what we call the rainbow rain that speed and density of the rainbow animation was based on the wind power potential at that time and we ended up really giving power back to the community um, with this project. Uh, we raised a lot of awareness about wind power potential. And um, so the project became live in 2016. Um, we had a new president in the United States and uh, the president put out a tweet uh, after pulling out of the historic Paris Climate Agreement saying I was elected by voters of Pittsburgh, not Paris. And the mayor of Pittsburgh that I who I had worked with to do this project, um, you know, was furious. He, he he knew that the citizens of his city wanted to um, follow the Paris Accord. And so I got a call. I, I was back in New Mexico, a couple thousand miles from Pittsburgh. And um, they said, you know, can you do something in solidarity with the people of Pittsburgh? So we were able to, using our cell phones, change the bridge uh, for that weekend in solidarity uh, with the climate agreement to green. Um, and it was really wonderful. Again, you know, because of using these hacker and maker tools, uh, making things so much more accessible um, to people. So when this that project came down in 2018, I was able to reuse a lot of the equipment and materials for a permanent project in Pittsburgh um, called Garrison Canal, uh, kind of trying to re-energize um, an alleyway. Um, and these are, um, it, it's become a selfie location. Uh, done uh, some smaller projects that have engaged the community. I'm wondering how we're doing on time. I don't want to, Ah, yes, we're getting we're getting there. So let me um, fly through. Um, just completed a project last year, also re-energizing a um, a dark al a dark area in Tampa, Florida. This is um, this is called BioBridge, attempting uh, to raise awareness of um, bioluminescent bacteria, which is a problem in the waterways in Florida. Um, and then just quickly flying through. So what I, some of the things I've been working on now, especially with students, is DIY bio. I've been working with the Biohack Academy and the, with the Vogue Society. 
um, creating and building uh, our own uh, biohacking equipment and uh, growing things like kombucha into materials, uh, creating some built um, structures and creating a, even we renovated a an old adobe um, in Santa Fe, New Mexico as a place uh, to do uh, climate related and bio um, hacking activities with the public. Um, this is Scott Kildall and Mick LaRusso and doing some of their biohacking activities, uh, Madeline Bolding. And just to end um, and frame the um, the Hack the Grid book uh, contains a little manifesto about what you can do, uh, what people can do uh, to hack the grid. Uh, and I'll just go through these 10 really quick. Uh, there's a lot more detail in the book. Learn as much as possible about how, how energy systems work. Know how much energy you consume and its environmental impact. Demand that energy providers tell you the source of the energy you purchase. Learn how to use the technology around you to gather information about your world and your environment. Learn to create the basic electronic circuit. Use a multimeter and read a circuit diagram. Learn to write computer programs. Learn how to harvest energy from the sun, the wind, the earth, and your body. Don't be a passive consumer audience of images, media, or technology. Understand that your life is inextricably intertwined with your use of energy in all forms. Learn from what uh, other learn from what others have done. Share your experiences and build your own communities of grid hackers. And that's the end. Thanks. And I'd love to take any questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrea. That was a, a really amazing journey through your creative uh, work and in uh, so many places from pole to pole and <laughs> across the united <laughs> states and uh, um uh, i'm sure we have questions from the audience uh, let me should i stop uh sharing uh oh. yeah it's okay we, we can bring okay. it back if, if there's specific questions of course okay so we have um, a couple of people here there's something in the chat uh um <clears throat> so i maybe i will start off with a little just a little question um we, we were discussing things like citizen science in the panel preceding um, your keynote here and uh, uh everybody kind of understands that citizen science is an is an interesting and a very valuable uh component of um uh, um, not just of communication, but but, but the, the whole ecosystem of information and knowledge, and it seems like uh, your your hack in the grid is um, cutting through there, and it's really building something up from the from the bottom up, as it were. So, would you sort of how to get these things started without? Can they be top down initiatives ever, citizen science projects, or or would you? say that it should always be built from the bottom up from communities yeah and i i prefer actually to use the term uh, community science than citizen science here in the us there's a lot of um challenges related to citizenship and so we want to um use a term that's not um making people who are not citizens feel like they're excluded um so community science um I mean, I think that there are a lot of communities here and we're working on some projects uh, related to this actually. So thank you um, for your question. Um, there are communities here that really don't have, don't have access. They don't have running water for, uh, you know, talk about internet access. They, they don't have running water in their communities. So I think in, in, many cases community members would like to start an initiative from the bottom up but they need um help to get started so to try and come up and i i, I won't say that i have the answers here but to come up with ways in which to um approach and collaborate with community members that puts everyone on an equal footing as far as the knowledge that people bring. So 
you know, a, com a community member may not have knowledge in how to program a microprocessor, but they might have incredible knowledge of um, local plant life and um, uh, rain patterns and, and those kinds of things. So to, to bring everyone together at the table with respect for the knowledge that people have, um, I think is incredibly um, important. But not necessarily like I don't think you need to say, well, it needs to be bottom up or yeah. top down or um, but I as the maybe coming from the institution, which is more the top top down um, to really enter into it with a respect um, for the, the knowledge that's coming from all members of the collaboration. So would you say that your experience when you started up the program in, in, in a web design, I would say that's really inviting a very multi, multimodal and multifaceted uh, information gathering. Um, do these, how do those things connect? I mean, I would imagine that um, the whole approach to web design is to gather multifarious data and to present it in some way. It, do you see it this way? Has that has that been useful for you? Well, one of the things that we often do is we look at um, the human centered design toolkit from uh, IDEO. Um, and, you know, there's a wonderful resources online for that. And when I'm teaching, um, whether it's app design or or web design. Um, will have the students go through some of those human centered design exercises, which means identifying your audience, uh, surveying your audience, interviewing um, potential audience members, looking at outliers and the, the perspectives of outliers, which can often help to define uh, the problem that you're approaching. And, you know, rather than coming from it from just an individual perspective, I think, you know, everyone can design a web page and put their portfolio online. You don't need to really worry about that. But if you're going into that uh, professionally or trying to solve a problem, um, I think the human centered design toolkit can really help. So let, let's hear from our, our, um, our small audience. Uh, I'm sure you have some questions in the room here. Uh, we have one in the chat. I can read it out. It comes from uh, Joyce Co in Singapore. So Andrea, thank you for thank you for taking us through this very rich body of work. I absolutely love Particle Falls. What was the reception like at the COP twenty one? Yeah, well, complicated because um, you know what it was wonderful um you know we were on a map of a number of different art projects throughout the city um the mona bismarck uh american center is is in a great location near the um the eiffel tower um of course there was a lot going on along the champs de Lycée. if you haven't seen some of the um the events that happen in the champs de Lycée, uh, the red line um it was really incredible um, but I, I say complicated because when we were there, it was about, I think it was about a year, um, a li little less than a year after the Charlie Hebdo um, uh, event. And very soon, around the same time that we were there, so people were still kind of reeling from that um, terrorist attack, really. There was another terrorist attack um, at the time that we were there. Um, it was at a, a nightclub. Um, yeah. like so, that. um, yeah, it was, uh, wonderful, the energy around addressing climate change, um, but also a, a challenging time for people and which, which I would say, you know, really some of these terrorist ac activities and, and the pressures that are happening. I'm sure this has come up in conversations that you all have had. I I would not say that that's unconnected to climate change. 
you know, climate change and the pressures that we're feeling economically and um, uh, with um, uh, people's need to re the re refugee crises and and you know people's need to find a safe uh, home is very much uh, you know interconnected. So Joyce follows up here with a yeah. with a comment. So I can imagine how difficult it must have been for the city. Thanks for elaborating. So that's from Joyce. Uh, and from Andras Blasek, uh, uh, you're very welcome to read read yourself if you want to use uh, your microphone. Uh, otherwise, I'm happy to do it. Andras, yeah, I'll I'll read your. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. Wow, that's funny. Yeah, that was a very it was a long time ago that project. So Intuitive Acusonics, um, as Emily's referring to, is a project that I did where I used an eye tracker to. Um, play music and it was improvisational music. I did a lot of um, uh, kind of uh, improvising with other uh, artists who use invented instruments. Um, yeah, I so, you know, for me with that project, I, um, I was really searching for a more direct way to create sound or music and um, through the course of playing it and exper and playing with experimental musicians and other types of improvising musicians, I really realized that, you know, this moment where your body disappears and you just feel the music and it happens is something that happens with someone playing a traditional instrument as well. It happens with a, a bass or a, um, a guitar or a piano. Um, that that feeling of your body disappearing can can come from any kind of music it does any kind of movement it doesn't have to be a movement that's closely internalized in your your eyes or something like that um but i do think yeah i mean i I'd, I'd love i i'm always interested when people are picking up that idea and i think we're definitely in a moment especially with the metaverse um and you know vr becoming um a uh, part of our experience of uh virtual space where i things like eye movements that are so subtle are really becoming a part of um are revealing ourselves when i was first doing that project i was interested in doing it because partially because eye tracking was being used by um companies to determine uh, how people were looking at advertisements online. And I think we have that happening in a much higher level with, with virtual reality in the metaverse. Let's have uh, maybe one more question from people. Uh, we have a thank you from Emily Bellabovino. So um, I, I think that the, the rich body of works that Andrea has shared is really gives, uh, gives us a lot of stimulation, a lot of ideas for how to approach this. And, and uh, as has been pointed out previously in, in this conference, it's, it's really such an oversized, uh, non-human size challenge of climate, uh, climate crisis that uh, we, we do need um, not just big big solutions big ideas we need many of them uh, we won't be able to grasp everything in any case any single person of us so i i would yeah, like I think to... in that in that problem of climate fatigue um mm -hmm. i think is is maybe some something that's something like hack the grid or other types of engagement projects that actually are bringing people's minds and their hands and their creativity into um, their response can can keep people engaged. Um. Thank you very much, Andrea, for for that hopeful ending and <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and we shall move on right now to uh, <clears throat> another place where we can uh, 
as you said, lose our minds in maybe mm -hmm. in the body, through body activity uh, of, uh, of a music kind, maybe some dancing, who knows? We're moving to the algorithm, uh, which is going to start uh, very